God bless you, Facebook and YouTube. How you doing? This is Robert Jenkins. It is a Sunday afternoon, 5.30. God bless everybody. Um, this is not a normal day that we normally come on. You know, usually we come on Monday through Fridays, five days out of a week. But there's been some things laid on my heart, and there's so many things laid on my heart. And sometimes I just need to talk and vent. And, um, and this particular thing that's on my heart today, I just feel like there's so many people who need to talk and vent. Uh, about this as well. This is something that's very common in the body of Christ and basically I, I just titled it church talk. Uh, so I just want to talk to us about some things that goes on in church and really about a lot of things that goes on in church uh, and just have conversations about it. So I invite a lot of people out and I know the football game is on on Sundays and a lot of people uh, probably won't tune in because they are interested in the football game and not that I'm against watching TV. But just some things I just want to get off my heart and just share with you and really begin to have dialogue. A lot of times I teach uh, Monday through Friday and I do a lot of teaching. And sometimes on Fridays we have a Q&A and we haven't been able to be consistent with that. But I want to know how you feel. So today is one of those days where I'm going to invite you uh, to come on. And uh, especially if I see you, if I see your name and someone that I feel um that I know and have a relationship with, uh, I may ask you to come on and just give me your comments about how you feel about church. I want to talk about uh, the church issue situation. And this can be bad and good. You know, there's so many things, you know, today praying about this and it's just been on my heart. And, um, and I just feel like what, where the world is right now, I just feel like that we need to get more serious about God. I feel like that many people who think they're in the right position with God, they're going to be left behind if the rapture would come any day now because we're not really pursuing God the way he's asking us. And I feel like God is like like, like knocking on the door so loud. And I feel like we've been having conversations about, you know, I need to get this together. I need to be better here. But we're not moving. It's like we say it off our lips and then two seconds later, we go right back to being where we were. So I just want to talk to you about um, church hurt. And I'm going to deal with some things this week. Um, Concerning that people who've been molested in church, those who've been abused, those who've been uh, controlled by pastors, those who have soul ties with pastors. Uh, my heart is becoming heavy with people who have real issues. And there are so many things, you know, and I said this before, I don't always like talking about the church. I was raised in the church. Uh, the church, in the sense, if I want to say it, is where I found uh, my Savior and where I found God. So who wants to talk about something that birthed them or that raised them? But the reality is, is that there are a lot of problems in church and there's a lot of mess in church and there's a lot of questions and I think we don't do enough dialogue. I talked about that. One of the problems that I have with church is that we don't allow people to have questions. I mean real questions with real answer. Unraw, I mean raw, uncensored questions, you know. So um, by not having that, sometimes um, the reality is, is that we don't know where people are. And sometimes the reality is this, we don't care. Sometimes we are so uh, indoctrinated with the way we have church, we just want you to come, <coughs> give your money, clap your hands, stand up, and go home. Uh, sometimes we don't care. So there's a lot of things that goes on in church. So I want to ask some, good to see you, Jamie. Uh, I want to ask people questions like, what does church do for you? Why? And I'm glad you're on, Dave, because I've been trying to reach you. Uh, I would want you to be one of the per persons that come on today. So I'll tell you soon, and I want you to invite me so you can come on. But I want to talk about what's the purpose of church. This is what I've been praying about. And let me share with you what's been on my heart concerning church. I've been praying with this with God, and I've been, I've been um, it, just like, me and God, we have these conversations and we go back and forth, okay? Good to see you, Mary. So I ask God questions like, if every church in your city was shut down, if there was nowhere where you can go to worship, would your city be better or would your city be worse? These are the questions that I'm asking myself. If there is no church, what would be the downfall of not having church? How would it hurt the city? How would it hurt the people of God? How would it hurt the world? And then the next question would be, uh, what can we do uh, as a church, as the people, that we don't need the building, that if we didn't have the building, we couldn't get it done? In other words, what does the building itself do for us? 
That's the question that I'm asking myself. What, and then the question is, why do we have a building? Now, I've been asking different people different questions, and one person said the building is no more than the address. It is the physical address in which we gather. And, and that was a great answer, was one of my friends. And I thought it was a great answer that the building itself is just the physical address in which we meet. He says, no difference if you want to come over my house and I gave you my address. We're meeting at my house. Now, the problem with, and I told him the same thing, the problem that I have with that is, is that if I met you at your house and the church is no different than the physical address in which we're meeting at, the, the, the difference, the problem between that answer and reality is, is that if I met you at your house, I'm not, I'm not paying your mortgage. You still pay your mortgage at your house because that's your house. Now, the problem I have, and I want to deal with everything that goes with church, the good and the bad. The problem with this, good to see you, Trina. The problem with this is that when I join a local church in a building, they now make me responsible for paying the mortgage. They're counting on my money, and I'm just going to be real today. We're taking off callers. We're taking off church language. We may refer back to it, but I just want to be real. you asking me to take monies off of the my 40 hours that I work, the 80 hours that I work, and you teaching me a principle that we call tithes and offerings so that I can help pay for another mortgage. Now, there are a lot of people, and we're just being real today. Good to see you, Jeff. Please stay on. I want you to be another person to come on, and I want you to talk to us today concerning some of these issues. And you and Pastor Todd just talked about these issues, so I know it should be already in your spirit. But when I look at if the church, the building itself is just a physical address in which we meet, the difference is if I met over Pastor Jeff House, I don't pay Pastor Jeff mortgage. He don't look for me coming to his house to contribute my money to his mortgage. But in the church building, we do. And we call that tithes and offering. And, we, and we'll tell people, who going to pay the lights here? Who going to pay the gas here? And who going to pay the water here? Now, another problem, and I'm dealing with real talk, how we think as people. People say, well, I would have never had this building. Now, I'm just going to give you some of my experience and I'm going to bring on Dave Felder first and right after him I'm going to bring on Pastor Jeff Stanford and we're just going to talk. Uh, some of the problems that I have, I've been in churches where one particular church, it, it held about six to seven hundred people, okay? The church itself only had about 50 faithful people to the church. Maybe only 17 out of those 50 uh, was paying tithes, okay? So this church holds four to 500 people. But there was a, but, but the pastor and his wife had a daycare center. And many churches have daycare centers where that's her job. Now, some people can look at it and criticize and say the bottom line, that's his job. He's a daycare center or he has whatever. He's using the church uh, for office. I've been in pastors where they did that. Um, it looked like we paying a mortgage so y'all can have a job uh, for y'all daycare center to raise the kids. Now, that's a reality. People look at that. People look at, well, why are we paying a mortgage $3,000 a month for a building to hold 400 people when at most we may have 50 that come and 20 of them is kids? Okay, this is a reality. And try to pay the organ player who wants eight hundred dollars a Sunday, and then the drummer he wants two hundred dollars a Sunday, and now we got the praise leader. He felt like he should have an anniversary. These are real questions concerning why do we need the building? Not just one street. There's so many streets we can go down. If it is our building, then why our name is not on the lease? Where I heard pastors say, my name is on that bulletin board out there. This is my church. And we have to look at all those avenues. Now, the other avenue is this. Members can get mad. They can leave and say, you know what? I'm done with the pastor. I don't agree with them having a daycare. I don't like. And then when they leave, who's responsible for that note? So on one end, we can say, you know what? He shouldn't. Uh, this is not his church. It's our church. But what, what happens when everybody leave? Who church is it? Okay, so we have to look at that. Now, we can say it belonged to God, but I want to have real talk about the importance. Now, I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to bring on Brother Dave Felder, and then I'm going to bring on Pastor Jeff. I want to say this. We have to look at all the dynamics. When I look at anything that does not work, in, in business sense, in business sense, when you look at anything that does not work the way it's been designed, the first thing they do is go back to the blueprint. The first thing they do is go back to how it was designed, how it was put together. And they really go all the way back to the print of it, of, of all the mechanics that it takes to do that. There are so many movies I can refer to that they was having problems with a product and they would check the line. Uh, Pastor Jeff works at GM. Something goes wrong and a whole car line shuts down. They go back and they check, why is this not operating? Why is this not working? Are we willing? Now, this is a big question. Are we willing 
to revisit the Bible concerning church and compare the way church is set up. Is that the way it should be set up now? Biblically versus 2017. Are we willing to do that? And if we come to find out that how the church uh, is set up now in 2017 and is not biblically correct, will we change it to meet how God wants it? That's just one aspect, okay? Another aspect is the Bible talks about how I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock I build my church. Are we supposed to build churches or are Christ supposed to build churches? That's another aspect. There's a scripture in the Bible that says that God does not dwell in temples that's made by hands. So does God dwell in the building because it was made by hands. These are all questions, and there's so many more. You know, on the post, I talked about uh, I struggle, and I am a musician. If anybody know me, I love music. I really do. I love music, and I love to be a part of a great band and praise and worship, but I struggle. This is me personally, Robert Jenkins. I struggle with music in the church, and the reason why I struggle with it, because it's not a strong New Testament teaching. Very few people can refer to the teachings of Jesus and bring up musicians. Now, that, that's a conflict because I love God and I love music, but if I'm looking at it biblically, can I support an organ player from the New Testament? We love to say tithes is of the Old Testament, is of the law, but when you start saying what's of the New Testament, there's a whole lot of other stuff that we do that we may not have biblical support to say that's true. So we have to deal with all of those things, okay? So I'm going to talk about that, and when you come on, I'm going to ask you some questions, Brother Dave. I'm going to ask you some questions. And then I'm going to move on And then Pastor Jeff If you're still there Let me know And then I'm going to have you Come on as well Brother Dave Go ahead and hit the invite button And let me invite you And let's talk about uh, Real talk about church I want to know what's going on And let's have real conversations Okay Alright Waiting on you uh, Brother Dave I hope you're still there All right. I don't. Okay, you said give you two minutes. Okay, go ahead and do what you're doing. Uh, Pastor Jeff, if you're still on, go ahead and hit that invite button and let me bring you on and let's ask some questions. Good to see Gwen, Gwen Johnson. God bless. Uh, this is so important. And I just want to talk about because there's some, sometimes we're going to church and we're frustrated, we're upset. Okay, there you go, Dave. All right. Bless you, man of God. Hey, man, what's going on with you? I'm enjoying what you're talking about. Okay, I was trying to reach you because I wanted to do some of the stuff with, um, you know, with the function of love as well, but we'll get to that later on. I'm probably going to be on a little lift today, but since we already started with the church thing, let's go there. So let me ask you the first question, and this is real talk today, so we want to just be transparent and be open. Are you a part of a church? Yes, I am a member of a church. Okay. All right, so good. That's the first thing. Second thing I want to ask you, what's your feelings right now concerning church? How do you really feel in your heart? Give me your pros and cons of that because there's a lot of people that have the same questions we have or have the same viewpoint that we have, but they don't talk. We have to, we have to be honest that sometimes only leaders will, will be willing to be bold enough to confront some things. Uh, so I want to confront those. I want to be able to be the voice for the people who may never say nothing. Uh, okay, Brother Jeff, as soon as he's done, uh, I don't know where that, where's that invite button at, Brother uh, Dave? Jeff is looking for that the invite. invite. The invite button is right along with the, the like button, the heart button. It's the button that's all the way to the left. So that's okay. the button he Brother, would hit. Okay, Brother Jeff, as soon as he's off, he said it's all the way, Pastor Jeff, it's all the way to the left. Right next to your invite button, your share button, and you'll see another button there. But as soon right, as so when he, so when, so if you click like during a video or heart or smile, it's the first button to the left, and okay. it looks like a square, it's like a square inside of a square, kind of like. Okay. Okay. All right. So, Pastor Jeff, as soon as we're done with Dave, we okay. Uh, we, we're gonna do it. Okay. Okay. So, Dave, give me your viewpoints on on church and talk to me, and let's be real. Like I said, um, I want to answer 
my purpose of this teaching, and Pastor Jeff and Pastor Todd from uh, Warren, Ohio, had been talking about this, and I thought it was very good dialogue. And then God just been dealing with me because I struggled. There's a time in my life that I was done with church, and uh, I wouldn't walk into it. There's another time that I was very committed and very loyal to church. You know, so you go through a lot of revelations. You go through a lot of pain. I've hurt, you know, I've talked about church hurt. I've even heard pastors say there's no such thing as church hurt. That was kind of offensive to me uh, because of the things that I've been through as if there's no church hurt. You know, and how do we recover? It's like people need to learn how to recover from divorce. People have to recover from losing a, a, a son or a daughter. They have to learn how to recover from losing jobs. We have to learn how to recover from uh, our viewpoints changing church. Or can we be bold and honest enough that church don't look like what we expect? And should it? It's our expectation. Uh, what we expect it isn't right. Is it biblical? I mean, there's a whole lot of dialogue and conversations from leaders, from the fivefold ministry to musicians being paid. Uh, how much money should we spend on the building? You know, can the pastor and his wife have credit cards and buy their own? I mean, there's a whole lot of dynamics. How much voice do my money have? You know, all this type of stuff. Is it right for uh, drummers to get fifty dollars, but the keyboard player get eight hundred? I mean, all these dynamics, should praise and worship leaders be, be paid? Should choir members should be paid? There's a whole lot of dialogue that goes on. Should the, should the pastor be able to use the building for his own profit later on? Like I talk about some daycares on the side. Uh, should, is it okay for you to go to get a building? No, we can't afford it. I've been a part of churches where they went out and bought equipment that the people could not afford and then forced the people that you're going to pay for this equipment. You know, so there's a whole lot of dynamics we have to deal with. Or I've been in church for years and no one has ever called me. I have not grown. I don't understand what the pastor is really doing. I mean, there's a whole lot of dynamics that we can't solve in one setting. But I just want to yeah, open yeah. up a platform to be able to talk about when the concerning church. Okay. Got you. Got you. All right. So tell me where you been. It's it's a blessing for you to open up this dialogue because. You're breaking up. We lost you. Uh, this dialogue, among so many others, needs to happen. Okay. And uh, people of God, bless you, Pastor Jeff. I see you, uh, Reverend Shadwick. So many of us on here, brothers and sisters. Jamie, um, I mean, the way that I feel about church is it's very interesting, knowing what happened today even. The, okay. um, the Texas shooting. Okay. It's hit the news. There, there, there's been another church shooting. Wow. And I that. Okay. It's been a, yes, yes. So we want to mention that. There's been another church shooting, and they're saying up to 20 or more people were murdered. Wow. In a church in, wow. in Texas, somewhere right outside of San Antonio. Wow. And, you know, it, it, it creates a level of relevancy for this conversation. First of all, we want to definitely say we are praying, you know, our prayers go out to those affected, uh, to that part of town. I heard that the town may have only had like 3,000 people based on the census from a year or two ago. Um, I was just reading it uh, as I arrived here at the house. So what they're saying is the, based on the amount of people that were supposedly killed at this church, they just lost 7% of their population. Wow. In that town. Wow. The church is supposed to be a house of prayer now right. it is something how you've been covering prayer right um you've done at least a was a three-part series on prayer right. right about the importance of prayer um and and and, and keeping watch over the gates right. because right. i am of the mindset unless it's something that the lord permits by his spirit that the people of god should have a level of prayer and intercession that we would be the spirit would impress on us if we're connected and in true fellowship, the spirit would impress on us, you know, right. Look, don't meet today. You know what I mean? Right. Or just, you know, some, if he would move on somebody's heart. If we're really, if we, if we really have the spirit of the living God residing within us, you mean to tell me God ain't going to reveal nothing to nobody. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And so I think sometimes, man, we get caught up in the formalities, something you talked about, which was, what would we do? How would our community be impacted if we had churches no more? If every church closed down? Well, the reality of it from the way that I see it is the church, for one, it again, is not the building. Hello. Right. 
The church is not the building. We're, we're the church. Right. You know, the kingdom of God is within us. Now, right. I'm thankful for congregations and for churches that come together for the sake of assembling. Um, my church, one thing that is very unique and I really uh, thank God about my church is they don't pressure you to tithe. They don't. Right. They don't pressure you to tithe and they don't pressure you to become a member. Right. Uh, because the Bible tells us we're members of one body. You know, right. whether I'm a member on the roll of a building, of an right. organization, right. or right. not, I'm already a member of the body of Christ. Right. Uh, for two, I came up in the Baptist church. I thank God for the Baptist church. The Baptist church is my foundation. I learned right. so much from the Baptist church in terms of organizational skills, in terms of right. minutes, in terms of the right ways to conduct meetings, in terms of, you know, the um, protocols being established and things of that right. sort. That's where I was licensed. That's right. my foundation. Uh, right. However, one thing that I, I, I realized when the Spirit of the Lord really began to deal with me and show me about the liberty that is in Christ is the Spirit was quenched in so many different capacities. Right. Okay. That's good stuff. Um, God may come and move by, by His Spirit, and we quench it, and we, and we don't go with what the Spirit is saying do because we want to... <laughs> preach we want to you know we want to go with the order of the flow of the program versus letting the holy spirit interrupt letting the holy spirit take over and you know and then there are other things you know and with any denomination you know there will be things that you know may not seem to be embraced you know like you got pentecostals you got church of god in christ you got baptist you got lutheran you got methodist and everybody feel like their way is right but the reality of it is the word of god is right the spirit of God is right. right. Um, and, and, and so I always look at it like this. What if there were no more Bibles? You know, is mm -hmm. there enough word in you to mm -hmm. sustain you for the rest of your life? Have you hidden his word in your heart that you might not sin against him? Right. Is there enough word in you to know about the truth right. of, of salvation in Christ Jesus, our Lord? Because... Right. You know, Paul said, look, when I came to y'all, look, I, I wasn't after nothing but Christ and him crucified. That, that was the only thing I was concerned about, making sure that that the crucified Christ is, is preached and his resurrection is preached and, and that we're receiving that, that we're receiving salvation and that we're repenting. You know, right. so if if the church of God is not directing people to a life changing encounter with Christ Jesus, we're right. off. You know what I mean? If we're right. about building, uh, uh, you know, a new building, and you know, and it's like so, we, we got so many things going on, right. and that's what bothers me sometimes. There's so many different things going on um, that that we're deviating from preaching Christ and Him crucified. That's right. what throws me off. But I thank God the ministry that I am a member of. Um, they are a sound Bible teaching, gospel preaching church, right. Right. And, and if if your church ain't a Bible teaching, a, a, a gospel preaching church, get out. <laughs> right. You know, and I, I, I'm in agreement. I just think that there are so many gray areas. Like, we as preachers, we, we, we can say stuff like, you know, if you're not part of a Bible-believing church. And that's the absolute truth. But who knows what is Bible-believing? When I was young... I was indoctrinated, but you couldn't tell me that wasn't the word of God because I wasn't skilled enough to know what was. It's like a little baby. And I said this today, one of my friends, I said, preachers got a responsibility because when people come to you and they sheep, they don't know if you teaching wrong or right. Like a baby don't know if you giving them jelly beans or steak. She's three months old. She's five months old. It is my responsibility as a parent to make sure I'm giving a child healthy food until they can determine what is healthy for themselves. So even though I can tell you, and I should tell you, you should go to a Bible-believing church. If you already been indoctrinated, you don't know, you know very little. You was born in the 90s or the 2000s. You didn't, ra you wasn't raised under Sunday school or YPWW. You may not have any clue. Anything that man tell you could sound good. We have to be honest. There are a lot of people gullible now because they don't know any better. So we can say, this church over here is a Bible-believing church. Well, how do you know that's a Bible-believing church? How do you even know what they're saying is true? 
what is church? What's the purpose of church? Have we had real dialogue? Because most of the time, religion indoctrinate us. And then, and when I, I was raised Baptist too. And Baptist people, they had Bible study, but very few people came. The older people came to Bible study. And when the minister preached, I'm saying from my experience in the Baptist church, they were very faithful, but they still smoked and they drank and they did that. So the people who was apostolic or Church of God in Christ, they would say they ain't living holy. Well, then I went up to the Church of God in Christ church and found out they preached against smoking and drinking, but they still were smoking and drinking in the background. They just figured out a better way to hide it or to cover it. So then we deal with that, that you got obvious lies or you have hidden lies. So what makes a great church? There is no perfect church. And that's what I want to talk about too, because a lot of times we can have these conversations and we can say, you need to have this kind of church and this kind of You're going to find the pros and the cons of that church. So in that, we have to be honest with all of that. And I'm good to see Mama, Ms. Shadrach. Mama, I would love for you to come on. I'll tell you when, if you can. So we have to talk about all of that. There's no perfect marriage. There's no perfect child. There's no perfect church. Uh, how much of the church corruption should you deal with? So if you say, I'm not going to deal with a church that has this, 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 and that, well, then we're going to find a church that don't have that, but have the other stuff, but it's so covered up or it's so polished that you never know. This is a real talk. So the, so the reality, again, is what's the purpose of church? Why am, I, why am I at a church? What am I looking for from a church? How do I define the church? And just because it may be healthy, unhealthy in this area, in this area, in this area, does that give me the right to leave? Does that, because it looks good in this area or that area or this area, does that give me the right to join? Like Dave said, the church he goes at, they don't push tithing and they don't push uh, uh, joining. Well, that can still be checked. And that's the reality. The church that I go to now, they don't put any emphasis on joining. You come, get for prayer, and you just come to the church. Well, I like that. I see Brother Dave coming back. I like that on one aspect, and then on the other aspect, I don't like that because uh, they haven't called me. At uh, the church I go to now, people may say, man, you got a powerful ministry. They don't even know I preach. See? So, but this is the same church who you don't have to join. All you got to do is come. Okay? So I can look at the positive, and I love that freedom that you don't have to join because I don't like joining churches because I feel like if I'm part of the body of Christ, why should I join? But I do understand. Yeah, see, see, and the, I got to look at it. But I, and the but thing I, about but that. I it. What's, what's the accountability if I don't? See, I can look at everybody who put their name down is not faithful. And there are some people who never join and they tied more than the people who join. But then you got the people. Who don't. But let me say this. Don't. Let me say this, because this is what often happens. This is what often happens. <laughs> see, freedom, there's a cost yes, of freedom. Is. There's a cost of freedom. There's a cost to understanding. But that which I have, you can't take right. from me. You can't take from me what God right. revealed. Right. You see, so when I know what the Bible says, that we are members of right. one body. See, you can't use the church right. hopper. Ooh, look at ooh, church hopping. Church. No, this is the body of right. Christ. But see, what happens is, if you want to visit, see, see, this is what God gave us. I'm so thankful that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is right. liberty. Huh? I'm so thankful that the word, the, the word of God is so rich and God has given us a smorgasbord. Right. Okay? We can eat at a variety of different places. I can go to another church today and eat the word. I can, I can go to a Baptist church and eat. I can go to a Pentecostal church and eat. I can go, I can go wherever I want to go. Right. But when you when you a member of a church, ooh we man, you will get stoned. You out here church hopping, church hopping. You know, and and when I and when I found my liberty in Christ, and I just would go and enjoy a a, a, a minister of music here or a psalmist here because it blessed me, or a preacher here. I would go to Hennings. I would go. You know, I I would go to. Uh, Zion Dominion in Buffalo, New York. I will go to Elam Christian Fellowship, Bishop Bronner. I will go to True Bethel, Darius Pridgen. And I will be blessed at each of these ministries. But you know, they started calling me a church hopper. 
Because I'm receiving God. I, I'm church hopping because I'm not at your church every Sunday. Um, at, you know, and it's, and it's real. It's real, man. So when you start talking about that, it's like, look, it's so real. But go ahead, man of God. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I, see, that's what I mean. All these dynamics have to be dealt with. Because uh, on one end, you may be blessed and you may say, with the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. Well, somebody may say that you don't, you're insubordinate and you have no accountability to anybody, that you don't want to be shepherd. This is real talk. That's what I mean by real talk. Uh, because I'm being led by the Spirit to go from different churches, people say if you eat from too, too many kitchens, you get sick. You can't eat from everybody's cooking. I mean, all of that. So we got to look at that. People would feel like, but you're not mature enough to do that. Well, 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 when I met your church, I was at another church, and you didn't have no problem when I joined your church. Or I came to your church, but when I visit somebody else, see, we have to deal with all the dynamics and we have to be real about all of it. Do you own me because I joined the church? Do, do, are you now my master to the point that I have to get your permission? All these things are dealt with all right. from a biblical point of view. Do you really care about me or do you care about my money? Or do you care about the numbers that I bring to your organization? This is real talk. Let me mention something. Let me touch on something because, as you know, I'm a musician, I'm a singer. I'm a worship leader, and I think it's a blessing, but it's also a serious responsibility. And you have to know that certain things come with being anointed. There's a cost to being anointed. There's a cost to be gifted and to be a vessel. Um, there are certain attacks that's going to come through you, and those attacks are often going to come through the head. And when I say the head, I'm talking about the leadership. Um, I'm not going to name the ministry. We're out last served that but some people who are on here may know but i was god was using me i knew it was an assignment and my wife and i joined a ministry to help um i was doing worship leading work i was building up the worship team god sent me there to help with the worship and with the musical portion so i was teaching the songs and i was really overextending myself but it was almost like the church wanted me there almost four or five days out the week. Um, and I think sometimes leaders pull on gifted. They pull on, you know, the gifted who are helping, but they do it sometimes to the point where it's almost demanding more from you than, than you really can give. And it also um, affects your home life. So my family life began to really get, affected because it was demanding so much um and there really wasn't a strong regard for that almost to the point where the leader was communicating to me where it's like you have to put god first and it was almost like what what he was meaning is this church has to mean more to you than your family right. and i think sometimes we have to balance you know and we have to know the boundaries of, of, of how much I can give versus how much I cannot. And we have to know the authority that we have within ourselves to say I to say no. We have to be able to say no uh, if we know that something is demand. Because my, my home is my first ministry. You know, my, 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 my house is my first church. You know what I mean? Yes, serving in God's ministry right. is, is definitely a priority to be used of God. Um, but it got to the point where I was being used so much, Reverend, that... Um, it was almost like the, the the flow of the spirit was happening on a greater level in worship. Come on, make it quick, Dave. We got some other people. Come on. <laughs> okay, it was really growing, but what I'm getting at is it got to a point where I I, I started getting attacked for serving. Wow. You know, and call coming through, but I'm just saying we have to be careful when we're gifted, and we have to know that attacks will okay. come, and going to stand in a ministry where you're being constantly attacked and in a certain t teaching that you did called spiritual abu right. abuse. That's kind of what I was right. undergoing. And God led us away from that situation because okay. of it. And, and, and see, that's real talk. And we got to have more discussions just on that subject, how not to be abused as a praise and worship leader. Uh, and all that goes along with that, uh, what the pastor is looking for, because if I'm a pastor of a church, and I'm going to say this, and I'm, Pastor Jeff, I want you to get ready. If I'm a pastor of a church, and I have you as my praise and worship leader, I don't want you visiting no other church. Now, unless I'm mature enough and have more people in place, because the anointing that you bring, I want it to be consistent. 
Okay, so I may feel like you're not accountable if you miss that. Now, I know you personally. I know that when you on post, you on post. But you have some people who take that scripture where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and they don't hold up their responsibility when they negotiate these deals. Okay, now then you have on the other end, you got pastors who abuse the people who are loyal and faithful. The people who get taken advantage of the most is the people who's always there. We love to preach to the choir. So we have to deal with all of those dynamics, and those are real dynamics. So if you can stay on, please stay on. I'm going to have Pastor Jeff come on, talk a little bit. Mama, if you still there, I want you to come on. And I want to pull different people on as we move closer to that, okay? Pastor Jeff, if you're ready, uh, go ahead and hit that invite button. So, and, and this is what I mean by church talk. Uh, th this is not one of my teachings, but these are, uh, th this is what I wanted to deal with today. Just have conversations. And we didn't know how you feel as a singer, as a praise and worship leader, uh, as a trustee, as a deacon, uh, as a minister in the church. You know, you got ministers that are wounded because they don't have the freedom to be who they are. Waiting on you to hit that button. Okay, there we go. Pastor Jeff, what's going on, man? I'm on. Okay, you there you me? go. I see. <laughs> yes, sir. What's going on with you, doctor? Man, how you, you doing, me? man? It's awesome, man. I, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. I can hear you. I appreciate it, man. This is awesome. Good, man. You know, I enjoyed you and Todd, man. Y'all touched on some serious stuff. Uh, I didn't text because what I had to say was so long. <laughs> so uh, maybe one day I'll be a part of that. We'll be so back. Cool. We'll be we'll back on. Huh? What you say? We'll be back on next Monday, man. So come on and come on, Doc. We'll, we'll, we'll let you on. <laughs> okay. So I'm basically talking about, you know, why should we have church? All the dynamics that come with church. I wanted to do something, that this real talk that we can talk about. There are a lot of people who are done with the church. There are people in transition. We know the church is falling in a lot of aspects of people leaving for various reasons. And just like when y'all, you and Pastor Todd talk, there are so many dynamics and layers to everything in church that you just can't, you can't hit it all. And I think sometimes we speak from, from one phase and not try to deal with all the phases that make it what it is, you know? So I'm really dealing with church pain, uh, concept of church, what is church? And like I said, I've been praying I want to really know what the purpose of church in its holistic form, like starting with the building. Like if we didn't have the building, could we still have church? What you do as a pastor, could you still do that thing as far as empowering people, blessing people, touching people, uh, equipping and disciple? Do you need a building to do that? And the trimmings that come along with a building. We know a building costs. We know we have to pay the electric, the gas. We know most time we think we need musicians, uh, all those things that may have nothing to do with real Bible study that makes impartation in people. When you really speak to people's lives, you know, sometimes the building is no more. And I talked about that. It's just an address, a place where we meet. But we have a lot of things that's tied to that, you know. So I just want to deal with that because I think a lot of excuses that we're using, we're, we're lying. We'll say I'm mad at the church when really it ain't the church you're mad at. It's this particular experience that you may be mad at. And how we look at that, or people say, I'm a part of a church, but they never go, or they have never grew. I've heard people say, I've been in church for 15 years, man, and I learned more from you in one day than I learned from the whole 15 years. So what is church? So I just want to get people's, and not right answers, but where you at? So usually I ask the people to come on, do you belong to a church? I know you belong, you're a pastor of a church. So <laughs> my next question would be, what is your feelings, pros and cons, about church well i'm gonna start off answering a couple of these questions for you um first of all um the first question you asked when we just started was do we need the church and my answer is simply for the most part yes i mean if especially if you if you got 200 or so people following you i mean i i can't fit 200 people in my house I mean, it, that's a reality. I can't, I can't fit 150 people in my house and sit down and talk to them. And, you know, they can't all use my bathroom and they can't all do this. And so I, I think that it's a necessary 
uh, and, and if you want to call it, a, or somebody wants to call it a necessary evil, but we have to have a place um, large enough that we can all be comfortable to worship. If we're going to have a worship experience and uh, not just a teaching, and not just a, uh, I mean, and it's, it's fine if you want to just come over my house and oh, like we used to do over yours, go over your house and have a Bible study and sit down and read the Bible and look, look at the scriptures, that's fine. That's a, that's a great thing. That's wonderful. And we can all learn from that. But if you're going to come and, and we're going to have a worship experience, uh, which I love to do. I love to praise. I love to worship. Hold on, son. Let me finish what I'm saying here. Yeah, you can write on that, baby. I'm sorry. That's my boy. Um, but uh, I, I think we, we need to have some type of building that allows us to uh, uh, hold all the, all the people and all the all the parishioners that want the teachings that we give. So you, okay, so let's, let's start right there. That's a good point. So you saying the building to house the people, that's the, that's the most important need of the building start, starting in your conversation is because we can't hold them in a building that, that doesn't meet the capacity. In order to help. That's one thing. That's okay, one thing. Actually, I just want to okay. take each one of them apart because I think people have a lot of questions. Because this is, this is where I go. When we say worship experience, um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people hide behind that because in okay. me and you may know, uh, if I went to 500 churches, um, which one will I really say is having a worship experience what, based upon what I know? Okay, so we can right. say, and that is a very valid point. I can't have 500 people in my house. So if 500 people is following me, I need to have a place in order to have this particular uh, event or let's say expression of God, which we call worship. But the thing would be, if I'm using a building, because I got to pull money from people to do that building, there's a whole lot to go along with just getting a building, and you know that. Uh, in oh, order definitely. to have a worship experience for these people, then I, I need to be make sure that I'm having a worship experience. In other words, let's not take people's money for a building and say we're supposed to be having a worship experience when we're not having a worship experience. Or you as a leader don't even know what worship is. You know what church Absolutely. and singing songs is. Because mm -hmm. there is a cost to get that building. Now, do I really need, and we got to ask ourselves, biblically, um, did Moses need a building? He had over a million people. So when we look at the purpose of it, and I'm just dealing with all the things that come. When we say that. I don't know if you can hear me. Are, are you hearing me? Yeah, uh, you, you going out, you going in and out, you going in and out, at least on my phone. Okay. Let me, um, cause somebody called me, so it may do that. Are you still, am I still going in and out? Now your, your voice is clear, but the picture ain't, but it's all good. I can hear you. So go ahead and talk. Okay. So I'll tell you what, let me click you off and then come back, hit the, hit the invite button again and come back. Okay. Okay. So can everybody else hear me clear? Sweetheart, are you hearing my words clear? Is the picture clear? I'm waiting on my wife to sweetheart. Can you hear me? Can somebody let me know if you can hear me? Okay, good. Okay. I'm waiting on pastor Jeff to come back. Okay, good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Okay. So, cause what I was saying is pastor Jeff making a very valid point. If you have people following you, uh, and, 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 and it's a large number that you can't put them in your house. Uh, you need to have a place to pull them. I am 100% in agreement with that. The problem with that is that, and we're saying based upon because we need a worship experience. He says, not because of teaching, not because I can't pray with you at my house, not because I can't talk to you, but for the worship experience. Now, so now we're adding on a dynamic that we need buildings because of the worship experience. Now, when Pastor Jeff come back, I'm going to talk about and here he goes. Give me a couple of seconds for him to come back. Waiting on you, Pastor Jeff. Okay. Am I, if, if everything clear? How are we looking? I'm here, but I can't hear nothing you saying. Okay. You still can't hear me? There you go. There you go. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So what I was saying, 
And I want people to know, uh, me and Pastor Jeff has a love for one another, so this is not a fight, but I'm throwing things. I'm being the devil's advocate. I want you to know that. But I, I really honor and respect what God is doing in this life. But when we look at, um, if I say we need a building for the capacity of people who's following you, because me and you both know that everybody who hear you don't follow you. Like, I, I may have 500, Absolutely. sometimes 500 people uh, watching me on here. But Lord knows if I started a church, I didn't have 500 members. Okay, so that's the reality. Absolutely. So reality is, like, the church, my first church that I had, and my only church in the sense that I was pastor over. I helped start churches, but I passed over. We could probably hold about 200 people, 250, okay? Um, and, but I didn't have 200 people following me. So that building was not because... I had 200 people follow me. Now, my expectation was for God to fill that place, okay? And right. I thank God for that. But the real reason why I got that building is because my rent was $50, okay? Mm -hmm. The real reason why I got that building, because I knew it would not tax the people. I had favor with the people who were there, so it didn't tax the people. I was doing Bible study in the house. You know that. It was packed, crammed. We would cram people in, pull out chairs, move the table to get people in. Uh, at that time, Pastor Jonathan was saying, man, you got to find a building. All these people in this small apartment that I have. So we moved. But we moved to a place that cost me. Uh, when we started seeing building, I think we need to look at that. When you have a building that's $5,000 for month rent, and me and you part, both have been part of ministries where the ministry was was a street ministry. It, it brought in people who didn't have much money, who was on crack right. cocaine. And then you burden them to pay for a building that you want, not that the people mm -hmm. need. So, so I have to look at that right. too because that's a dynamic. Now, people can misunderstand your heart when you're saying you need people to hold a capacity. You love people. You ain't saying, I'm going to get me a million dollar building. I'm, I'm going to do this because right. I want to look good. See what I'm saying? So we have to distinguish, distinguish between those who have a real heart and know that I can't put the people in my house. If I had the house, I would. If it, if it had to right. do right. burden the people and not burden the people, I would put them in my basement and not burden the people. That's the difference between <laughs> people who go out and get a million dollar building and then make the people pay for it through the disguise of tithes and offering and 90% of the money coming in is going to a building that we can, and, and we only have 17 people, we can be effective more in somebody's living room or basement or pray for favor that another church can maybe share with us their church or share with us their basement. These things are important, but we have to look at what we have made the building, see? So that's what I'm looking at, right? part of a man who's saying, look, I got all these people following me, man. And I don't know why, but for some reason, people are following me, they want to hear me, I need a place to pull them. Then we should find a place to put them so that we can maintain, see those, and that's aspect of it. But but when we just look at buildings itself, I think once again, go ahead. Can you hear me? I think once again, yeah, you know, it goes back me. once again to the to. Can you hear me? I think yeah. once again it goes back to the back to the thing with what Pastor Todd and I was talking about about merging. And if you only have ten members over here, I only have ten members over here. You only have thirteen over here. Uh, it goes back to let let's let's do something together. Let's stop. Right. Uh, let's let's. If there's no sense, like you said, in taxing the people and taxing people. But for me personally, um, I want to go back to what Pastor Dave was saying, or Brother Dave was saying, Minister Dave, uh, that you know, for me, I I ask the people not to actually join Beulah, but to become a part of the family. Right. You see what I'm saying? I think there's a difference because membership, uh, you know, uh, you know, Sister Andrea Southern, she got up today and she said she's, you know, moving to Columbus and she's a member at Beulah or a part of the family. And I said, see, membership, I can take you off the roll, but you're always going to be part of the family. So right. when you get up and you join Beulah, you become part of the family. So now we eat together. We pray together. If you got issues, I got issues. If your right. bills are due, my bills are due. We, we, right. we give together because this is our church. This ain't Pastor Jeff's. This is our church. But once again, like you said, if everybody leaves, the bills are still on me. Right. <laughs> so it's my, it's my, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And it, 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 it's come to that. There's been times where, you know, I have to shell out and, that, and that's fine. But the point of the matter is if we, if we don't say that it's, you know, uh, 
this pastor Jeff Church. No, this ain't my church. I don't got no member. Then another thing, real quick, um, is that. You know, we have to get to the point of just because I'm carrying the weight doesn't mean I have a right to control you. Right. Good. Just because I'm carrying Good. the weight of the ministry. And I know too many people who have allowed you to place their load on them only for you to be loyal to them. Woo. Right. 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 So we, we, we have to, we, and we have to like, uh, I've seen a couple of people, we have to be careful what leaders we choose. We have to be careful who we follow. There, I mean, there is no uh, perfect solution. Like you said, there is no perfect churches. Ain't nothing. But my thing is this, it's still, especially in the African-American community, it's still one of the only properties that we own, that we have rights, that we share rights. That, and, and, and there's still people who are out there on the streets who, if they don't know no place else to go, they're coming to the church. Right. When right. all else fails. Right. When the police department is against them, when the when the judges is against them, they're coming to the church. And we have to be there. Right. And I'm gonna be there. Right. I don't know about what everybody else do. I know at Beulah we're gonna be right. there. Right. And and, and that's that's I'm what sorry. I was saying. You, I'm breaking up again. Can you hear me? I think I lost it's going you. in and out, but I'm listening. Uh, you can't see me, but you can hear me? No, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I was saying that when it comes to the church, as far as I'm concerned, there are some things that need to be eliminated. There are some things that need to be corrected. There are some things that need to be improved. There are some things that need to be reviewed. I don't think we should throw it all away. I think we should go back to the biblical understanding of the church and examine it all. The things that need to be corrected, let's correct it. I agree with you. It has always been the strongest institution as an African-American man that we have. So I think we should treasure that. But because it's the only, let's not abuse it. Let's use it for the right reason. If it's the only thing we have, then that should give some integrity to the office and to the positions. Yeah. Because if it's the only thing we have and we got corrupt people in that position, then we're doomed. You see what I'm saying? So I say I agree with Definitely. you that it's the only thing that we've always had and we have the right to and almost like, you know, we can we can control it, but we have to have the right people in position that have real love. Jesus was very careful of making sure that leadership understand love for people. If you love me, feed my sheep. And your love for God mm -hmm. is second to like unto your neighbor. You love your neighbor as yourself. But when we have people who have come into the office because they're gifted alone or they see a way to make money or it's a way to exercise their ego and their controlling mechanism, it is dangerous. And me and you both know that if we was not pastors of churches, we would maybe one or two churches in our city would we want to be a part of. Even us as pastors, we would say, no, not that person. No, right? no, yeah. no not that person. So, so we can't ignore these issues that people are saying, because we saying them too. <laughs> you know, we have to be honest. Now, maybe one or two people that we feel like is solid, and, and, and even those one or two people, their church is not perfect, but it's the best balance for us. And I lost them for there. So I, I, so I, I want to talk about that because that's real. I've heard pastors tell me, if I wasn't a pastor, I wouldn't join nobody's church. Well, so you don't see nobody's church right but yours? See, that's a real talk. So these, are, and, and what I'm doing is these are discussions. I'm not telling you to shut the church down. I'm not telling you to keep the church up. I'm telling you we need to have conversations, first of all, with God, with the Holy Spirit, and with one another. And let's be honest about what's not working. And let's try to improve. If that means joining, as Pastor Jeff would say, with another church because you're struggling. And, and, and Pastor Todd said it very a uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, poetic the other day, he said that sometimes you can be struggling, I'm paraphrasing, you can be struggling so much that you don't have room to care. In other words, what Pastor Todd was saying is that that I'm, I'm struggling with the seven people I got or the 70 people I got. I can't care about the city or the world or the global. I got to hope that my life is on next Sunday or my gas is on. Pastor Jeff talked about the other day, and you get a chance to go to this page and watch the teaching that he had. He talked about how his heat was off. I think it was his heat, and um, he had to go to another church. So, and this this is real talk, so we have to deal with this. But, and me and my wife, we talk about this all the time. I 
say, we're not working, okay, we're not working to give 80% of our check to bills. I'm not, I'm not trying to work every day of the week and get 80% of my check goes to, 80% of my check goes to electric, gas, cable, food, groceries, dishwashing the liquid, uh, cutting the grass, lawnmowers. No. And it's the same thing with a church. When you have a church that is 80% of it is going towards the bills of the church. We have to look at these things. We have to review these things. Uh, and this is just, we're just dealing now on the natural aspect of it. The spiritual aspect of it is, is, where, is prayer where it needs to be. Do we have intercessors? Do we have uh, people in position to be able to teach Bible study? Are we wearing out the pastor? Uh, pastor Todd talks about that. A lot of leaders are just wore out. They just wore down. We got to look at this. We got to look at what church is, what church was, and what church should be. See, we have to look at that. Uh, is church different in New York City than it is in New Orleans? Is the principalities different? Is the economy different? Is uh, the style of leadership? I remember when I used to travel as a musician uh, across the world, and I'm waiting on you to come in clear, Pastor Jeff. Uh, you kind of, it's frozen there. But I remember traveling as a musician across the world. They used to tell me when I would go to California and I would go to New York and I would go to Atlanta, they would say, there's a different salvation for the entertainers in the big cities than it is the small cities because of the sins that they were doing in the big cities, and they still said they were saved. You had strippers who said they loved the Lord. Uh, you had entertainers who were bisexuals who said they loved the Lord. You had homosexuality that said they were. I remember when Tone uh, began to express his struggle with homosexuality. Now, I don't even call it a struggle. He said that he was gay. And, and, and we have loved Tone. And Tone was anointed at one time but when he made this confession about homosexuality. And it, wasn't, it shouldn't have been new to us because when he wrote the song, Lord, Make Me Over, he was saying it then. But again, so when we look at church, is it okay to have church? You know, I've been in churches where the first lady, I mean, uh, 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 well, let me say, not the first lady, but the... Uh, 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 the mother of the church was a man. I've been to church where the mother of the church is a man. So we have to deal with all of those dynamics. And I told you, they go on and on, layer after layer after layer. Uh, but I think we need to solve some things. Like, is there a need for a building? Yes, there is a need for a building when you have people following you at a large number you cannot put in your house. Should we go back to house ministries? I am 100 percent in agreement with sale ministries, but then we got to ask that. Uh, do they collect offering? I mean, there's so many dynamics, and that's why I said we have to talk. I have a problem with a lot of these new preachers that making their gift. Uh, it's about profit. It's about money. Even a lot of pastors who come on uh, uh, Facebook and come on YouTube, I, I struggle with them, and a lot of times they have a powerful message, but I struggle at the end when they say, if you give me $100, God will bless you. You blew your whole message to me. I don't care how wonderful it is. Now, maybe that's wrong, but I struggle with when you it seemed to be that you set people up to hear a good word so that you can draw and get money. So now Facebook and YouTube have to come away so I don't have to have a building, but I'm collecting money. So you got people collecting thousands and thousands of dollars who are not paying electric bill and the gas bill, but they're taking money from that. So I, so I have a problem with that. When your money conscious, when it's profit, am I saying that you should not be blessed? I'm not saying you shouldn't be blessed, but I'm saying why are you looking at money as the blessing? I got to look at that. And I'm not saying it's yes or no, but I got to look at that because the devil, he creeps in. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of deceitfulness. Uh, Brother James Summers says it very key. He said the devil will tell you truth to spread his lies. And we got card artists that operating from the church, that they're prostitutes you. Some churches, you're only a number. Some churches, you're only an offering. Uh, you, because you're tied. Uh, you can go to some churches, and the minute they find out that you and your wife make six figures, they're going to put you in leadership. has nothing to do with where you are in God and your growth. Uh, that's very key. Certain uh, ministries will embrace you until there's a real rumor about your life. Then they cut you off and shut you down and sit you out. So we have to deal with that. The right way to handle. Church is a very difficult thing, but I want to say this. There is no perfect church. Uh, does this excuse irresponsible leadership? No, it does not. 
Does it uh, excuse uh, a lack of accountability? No, it does not. But we have to look at it in every aspect. We got to look at denominations. Should we have denominations? Should we have the pastor? Should the five-fold ministry, is, should all five get paid? Uh, we, I, I told you, there's a lot of things we have to look at. And I'm going to be honest with you, Robert Jenkins don't have all the answers. I love to have discussions. I love to listen to other people that may have some experience in a different area than me or have more experience or may be wicked, but I want to hear why you think that way. See, I want to know why the slave master think the way he think. See, so that's very key because I want to know what to do as well as what's not to do. So all of those are dynamics. We thank God for our brother Dave Felder, and, and we also thank God for Pastor Jeff uh, coming on. And Mama was on for a minute. If you're still there, let me know. And I wanted her. Uh, she's a seasoned woman. She's out of Buffalo, New York. And if she's still on, I'm going to have her tell me some views. And I just want to talk to God's people. I didn't have any idea uh, that a church, you know, had some people murdered today uh, in that city that Dave talked about. And I'm going to get more details on it when I get off. Uh, but this is, a, this is a reality again. And we, we have to look at that. I remember, and I call out names sometime, and trust me, Judge my heart and not my head. I just call out to be to, to verify. But I remember when Juanita Byam, prophetess Juanita Byam, went through her marriage situation uh, with her and her husband at that time. And I remember Tom Joyner said, she's supposed to be a prophet. She didn't see that coming. And that was offensive to me because I believe in the prophetic. I believe in church. And that was offensive to me for him to say that. But the reality is he didn't say nothing I wasn't thinking. I was thinking the same thing. I was saying if she's so into God and so what, that, that she's a prophetess, why does she see that coming? And I know a lot of people in my own life probably wonder why if Jenkins is so deep and he knows so much word, why, why he's been married so many times? Or why did this? And this is a reality. See, so we have to deal with all the things that happen to us. Just because I told you before, the Bible says uh, Lazarus was sick but not unto death, but then he did die. The Bible says he was a friend of God and he was a sick, but his sickness was not unto death. But Lazarus died, and he was dead for four days. So the reality is that just because you're a friend of God don't mean you don't die. And just because the Bible says it's not a sickness unto death don't mean you have the proper interpretation of what death is. So these things happen, okay? God's people, sometimes you're like Jonah, and you find yourself in the belly of the whale. Sometimes you're like Peter, and even though you said thou art the Christ, you deny Christ three times. Okay, so this is reality. So just because you're part of a church don't mean you're always going to make the right choices as a leader. Some things, I can, I can say all day long, I hate to be religious or I hate religion. But I may have some religion in me that I have not dealt with that's still making me do certain things and say certain things. So we have to deal with the church has a lot of religion. It has a lot of culture. It may have a lot of spirituality, but it is growing. And, and, and this is the dynamic. Uh, my wife talks about. She talks to me a lot of times and she says something, most times she says something real deep. But there's one particular time she says something real deep. She said, you know, we die and live at the same time. There's a dying a part of us and a living at the same time. And the church is doing that. The church is rising and falling at the same time. The church is dying and, and living at the same time. We all have flaws. You got it right. This is a reality of it. Uh, but, and I can say that. Again, we can say that. I'm sitting in my living room right now. But I don't want to say we all have flaws at the expense of my daughter being raped by church, socially, spiritually, or emotionally. So even though I know that reality, I don't want that reality to come that close to my house. See? See? I don't want to be the husband that my wife goes in a hotel and dies on cocaine and she's a national preacher all over the world. I don't want to be the wife that my husband has one of the largest churches and then he's accused of being a homosexual and boys are saying he slept with him. See? So even though all this mess is in the church, who wants to be that person? I don't want to be the Colton Pearson that everybody loved and then when he preached the all-inclusive gospel, people say he's a heathen. Oh, but this is a reality that we grow and we grow in and we grow out. We grow away and we grow close. And we have to deal with all of those dynamics that comes with it. Okay? And you're right, Jamie. Flaws are not an excuse. But, we have, but we're not talking about it. So and even though we know that flaws are not an excuse, many flaws are pulling people away from God, away from church, away from their marriage. People have lost their husbands to religion. People have lost their wives to religion. Children has lost their mother and father to religion. We have hurt people in the name of religion. We have wounded people in the name of flaws. They're not an excuse. 
And then we have to deal with that and the consequences and the accountability and all these things. So that's why I wanted to talk. I wanted to know how you feel, okay, brother? Because I think restoration needs to begin if you've been church hurt or pastor hurt or pastor abused or overlooked or misunderstood. I want to, let's talk. You know, one of the things that I struggle with is that many people follow me. Many people. I have people all overseas, UK, whatever, come on consistently at 530. But I don't want them to be, listen to me, uh, let's say years, of, like, and then they end up in hell because they never knew how to apply it. Or they never was honest. You know how many people who have been married, but they haven't, they haven't loved their husbands since the three weeks after the marriage? You know how many people have been a part of church? But have not been a part of church, but they go every Sunday, never miss, but they still bound. There was a lady who was in church for 18 years. She had been going to church on a regular basis until Jesus came. She had been bent though for 18 years. There's another man who sat at the gate for years and was wounded. Everybody kept giving him money, but nobody gave him healing. There's another man who sat at the pool for 38 years. 38 years. Jesus only lived the earth 33 and a half years. So he was there five years before Jesus was born in the manger. 38 years he had been sitting in this pool and could not get. So we have to deal with all the dynamics that come along with that. And we can't be afraid to question. We can't be afraid. we got to ask questions like, should we be concerned how much money a pastor make? Is it okay to make millions of dollars off of people? See? Right. We have to deal with all of these dynamics. How much money should we make? How much money should we raise? How much money should we pull, spend on a, on a pulpit? And these things may be trivial, but we got to get to, uh, should we have a church that has no evangelistic team? Should we deal with that? And why is that? Should we be a part of a church that has no real Bible study? Should we be a, a part of a church that never, nobody ever grows up in that church? Should we, should we still be consistent of church that, ever, that, that, that nine out of ten out of every marriage that be at that church end up in divorce? I've been a part of churches where they are successful at making sure that when marriages join that church, they end up in a divorce. Now, it may look like the, the marriage is already on, a, on the verge of breaking up, but it seemed like the minute they come to that church, they break up. That, there is, that that whole church is full of divorced people. And their marriages cause problems, or, or, or they seem like the spirit on that church attacks families. We have to deal with that because we can say, I'm faithful to my church. I love my church. And somebody can say, there's no su successful marriage at that church. Or you notice that that church is known for young girls being pregnant at. And it has one of the highest pregnancies in the city of church pregnancies in that church. Or there's no strong youth department at that church. And they cannot keep any youth. The only reason why that church is sustaining for 30 years and 45 years is because of the same 30 faithful older people over the age of 55 years old. So we have to look at all the dynamics of that because people are hurting. There are some young men who want to be a part of church. And we can go on forever. These are unending. Uh, but I, it reminded me of a story that I was told. And the story goes on. Good to see you, Lonnie. Man, God bless you, old friend of mine. It's, it, it, it's, it's a story about a guy who was walking along, a, I think, a river or a beach or something. And all these fish was up on the land. And it blew all these fish up. And um, one guy came by. And it was throwing the fish back in the water. And the, and the young guy said to, to the older guy, I don't know why you're throwing these fish back in the water. You can't save all these fishes up here drown. See all, all these fish? There's too many fish here. You'll not be able to save one. And he picked one up and said, tell that to this one. And he threw it back in the water. Which means I can't save all the fish. You're correct. But I can begin a process of saving the ones that are reachable. The ones that are close. See? So we're not going to be able to solve every church issue. We're not going to be able to, but what can you do in your local church? Or what can you do as far as the, the, the pros and the cons? Okay? We understand. And we have to look at every dynamic. And nothing should be uh, to the point that we can't uncover it. And it's going to need more and more conversations. And just because we get the information don't mean it's going to change overnight. Okay? So this is reality. So we have to look at that, okay? And look at the hurt. And we can't ignore people who say, I'm done with church because we think we have the reasons why they should not be done as if we're not sensitive to their pain. At the same time, the people who say, I'm done with church, you can't get upset when people say, I would never leave church and call them religious because they have a conviction about why they want to still be a part of a church. Because we have to look at it that Christ did establish the church. And we know church is not the building. Again, we got the best way to mess up a word is, is to redefine its definition. So we have to redefine how do we define church? 
but we can't say there's no need for the building because, as Pastor Jeff would say, if you have 300 people following you and you want to have a worship experience, now we have to deal again. And I, and I said that because we can't call everything a, work, a worship experience. A lot of times we're hiding behind language and we're hiding behind Lego. We're hiding behind it. We say we need a worship experience. Well, somebody may say that's not a worship experience. That's not true worship. See what I'm saying? See, because well, again, can you worship God with human hands? They that worship God must worship God in spirit and truth. So we have to deal with that. As I said earlier, where in the New Testament does it support having an organ? Do we need the Bible to support everything in the church? Because you can't find Jesus talking about having an organ. And if it's okay to have an organ and have drums, and I love them. I'm a musician. Okay, well, what about the person who plays the tuba? Can he play too? The person who plays the clarinet, can he play too? And you may say, sure, we'll have a brass section. Well, can I get paid? Because you're paying the organ player. So we have to look at all of those dynamics. And people who give their money, they look at where their money is going. All of these dynamics, okay? So I don't want to do all the talking. I do want to do that. Um, I'm looking for mama didn't come on. So I'm trying to bring on certain people, and we have to look at all of those dynamics um, for that. So let me see. Let me see. Okay, Carla Wilson, I haven't seen you in years. Uh, come on, hit that, hit that invite button, and if you don't mind, you come on. Jamie, if you uh, hit that button, have you come on. I just want to talk to some people and give me your viewpoints if you don't mind. Sometimes everybody don't want to be seen. My wife is a person, she likes to make a powerful effect, but she just, she's not a person that has to be up front. Uh, she loves the help from the back. She loves the help uh, from behind the scenes. So I'm trying to get some more people to come on and just, just talk about your pain and your issue. If you hit that invite button, I'll bring you on. Good to see you, Patricia Adams. God bless you. Okay, you can't see the invite. Okay. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Because I wanted to bring on new faces and new voices and just hear what people are saying. All right, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And if this has been a help uh, to you, please let me know. Uh, if it's been a blessing to you. Okay, Mama, I'm waiting on you. Okay, come on, hit that, hit that invite button. This is my mama from Buffalo. I trust her wisdom. And uh, she's been a blessing to me. She's been there uh, through a lot of my trials and ups and downs. And uh, she has a lot of wisdom to give us. Okay, I'm waiting on you, Mama. Hit that invite button. It looked like a camera almost. God bless everybody that's here. If you want to have something to say, you can type in. My wife is always listening. You can type in. Okay, here we go. All right. This is Shadrach. <laughs> She's coming on soon. Go ahead and accept that, Mama. You hit that accept button. Hey, hey. Hey. What's going on, Mama? You, baby. <laughs> I love you so Listen, much. I love you so much. Let me tell you, this is one fantastic discussion. I hope that you will continue it as a series. And if now is not the season for you to do it as a series, that you will visit it again when you have an opportunity. Because this is the kind of stuff that's really going to help people and save lives. And I mean truly rebuild what we're calling church. Okay? Right. Oh, right. Because we are dealing with a group of people now who are not only unchurched, but several of them are uninterested and they are searching. They're searching high and low, looking for a truth that's not being provided to them from uh, a Jesus Christ, one God, Holy Spirit aspect. Right. Okay? Right. They're searching this world everywhere, trying to find those kinds of things that are going to help to impact their lives and make their lives meaningful, Robert. And that's right. something that this church needs to be doing right now. If, if right. I look, when I look at the world and I see a lot of the stuff that's going on, 
Right. You know, a lot of this nonsensical kind of killing, the way hatred is at an all-time high, the, right. the mistreatment that we blatantly give one another, okay, right. the, the pollutants that have absolutely distorted what true love looks like and all those kinds of things, I blame us. Right. I don't, I don't blame nobody else in the world. I blame that so-called Christian I love Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit following the one true God community for some of that stuff because we have not done sufficiently the work that we were supposed to do while playing at Woo! church. Come on, mama. And at the exact same time, church is infinitely uh, important and right. And the Bible instructs us not to right. forsake the joining of ourselves together, right. to come together, to lift up each other, to exhort each other, to learn, right. okay, to, to right. help each other out, you know, and, and, and those are the things that we need to be really doing and focusing on so that we can make the kinds of difference in this world that would make Jesus really say to us, well done, right. good and faithful servant, when he looks at us at the end of our time. So, so that's the kind of thing that concerns me most of all is the condition of young people in this country. The condition right. of young Christians who are bringing right. all other winds and doctrines into Christianity and trying to call that truth. And in fact, it's not. You hear what I'm saying? Right. So right. I'm like, I'm like, we have got to find a way in that gathering together of church to redefine what that looks like enough that it not only entices and invites young people in, but it listens to them. And it wow. helps them to understand what truth is. We got to encourage people to read the word of God for themselves. Come on. Read My it for yourself. Out. That's it. Read it for That's yourself. It. Right. If you really want to know what time it is, you ain't right. got to guess. You can read the word of God for yourself. Every time minister, elder, apostle, teacher opens up their mouths and gives you a word of scripture, you ought to be opening up your Bible and reading it. And right. then at some point later on, it should, it should fall to you to want to know right. so that you can take the time and read what the entire text is saying, or at least what that chapter is, so that you can study to show yourself approved by who? By God. So that you will rightly divide right. the word of truth. Right? Because if you're an engineer, right. you study, don't you? You put in whatever amount That's of time right. it is you got to put in in school to get your degree. Isn't that right? Right. If you're a doctor, you study, don't you? Right. You go to school for 8, 9, 10, 12 years. Do whatever it is that is required of you to do so that you can perfect your understanding. Isn't that right? That's it. Okay. If you're a teacher. Heck, if you just right. a dancer, Robert, how many hours did you put in playing them drums so that you could be a perfected drummer in right. the courts That's of the it. Lord? You see what That's I'm saying? It. So then right. do the same thing with the word. Do the exact right. same thing with that word. Study it and open up your eyes and your minds and your hearts and your ears and invite the Holy Spirit to come and guide you. See, I don't believe we serve a God who, who's ever told a lie. I don't believe it. I'm, right. Robert, I'm one of those knuckleheads that believes the word of God from in the beginning to even so come Lord Jesus. I just believe it, okay? Right. And because right. that's where my feet tread, I know that, that there's some faith and some confidence that I can have in that word, okay? And there's a lot of things here that we can talk about. And again, I really hope and pray that you will do this as a series. Church hurt, been there. Wanted right. to walk away, been there. Right. Lied right. on, cheated, abused, knocked down, kicked put out been right there okay yeah. in terms yeah. of church but then there's also the me that i bring to church see i Ooh, can't go through on. none of that without me being a part of it see come what i mean now. right and the me that i bring to church is the me that's out here in the world yeah it yeah. ain't saved sanctified holy ghost filled and fire baptized it's right. me looking at right. negroes sometimes and wanting to knock their heads off of the nonsense that they have said and done it's me oh. going to a job that don't love me but i gotta have it because i need the coins so that i can support my life you know what right. i'm saying right. it's me looking at my children who are falling down and i don't know how to help them up no more it's me looking at all Ooh. of these kinds of things that's who i bring into the church house Ooh, so when on, some of this other stuff happens to me there, okay, it may be because I'm misunderstood. It may be because people don't quite know what to do with me, or maybe people feel like they're invading my space or my privacy. I don't know. All right. I'm saying is I am an essential part of the equation, and Ooh. I come to be uplifted, to be um, helped, to learn, okay, right. and to have the opportunities to find those ways within myself that have to be Yielded, repented, right. forgiven, right. all of that, right. all of that, 
And so right. because I know those things are true about me, when I come, I come maybe with a little bit more openness than some others do, even, even when I'm not being treated right, right. by anybody else in the church. Because right. at the very, very end of the day, at the very end of the day, when the lights go out and I pull the covers up around my shoulders, it's me and the Lord. And the conversation that we are having then is between he and I, right? Right. And it's what I have or have not done, right? Right. It's what I've learned or let go of learning, right? Right, yep. And so I have to deal with me. So these conversations are so necessary because you're going to help us through the conversations of other more learned men and women than I am that you bring on here. You're going to be able to help us avoid some of those stumbling blocks and gain an even greater understanding of what church, like you said, was, is, right. should be, and could be. Right. And I am prayerful over the success of it all because I know it's necessary. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, Mama, okay, I done. thank you for that wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you I'm for that wisdom. Right. <laughs> Are you there? Can I'm you still me? here. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Look, I want you to uh, tell me, tell the people from your church hurt, how did you recover from the church hurt? And then how did you recover from the... Uh, the uh, the honesty that you were broken and a lot of things that happened to you, you played a part. A lot of times we don't want to uh, take on our part of the brokenness. So yeah, I talked about, true. you know, I've been married and divorced and I said I had to learn how to be healed from a divorce. Most people that's don't right. know how to have a funeral in their life. The, play, the purpose right. of having a funeral mm -hmm. and they have an open casket is so that you can have closure that is dead. We don't know how to lay lay to rest things that are died. So That's my last true. church, I don't know how to have a funeral over it. My last right. marriage, I don't know how to have a funeral. My last pain or rejection. So most people can't recover because there's never been a true closure. See the right. right. And, 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 and right. the hardest part of the closure is when it may be dead because of some things you did. I tell people, Man. I made some terrible decisions. But when I look back over my life, I can tell you why I made them because I I know where I was in my mind when I made that exactly. choice. And some of that exactly. truth is devastating when I say it it's me. It's, it's yep. my selfishness. I don't want to believe I'm prideful. Everybody has something that they're honest about themselves. They don't want to believe about themselves, but it's real. <laughs> so I, want you to share, I want you to share yeah. with the people how did you recover because a lot of people I've heard people say, I'll never go to church again, or I'll never be married again, or I'll yeah. never trust a man again. How do you yeah. recover to wholeness when you've been shattered? What was your method, or what do you recommend? My, 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 my method first, the first thing that I, I believe that you have to do is you have to take a moment from the situation and look at yourself. You, wow. you really do. You have to step away from the situation and look clearly at you okay and you gotta ask yourself some questions okay what did i add or not add to this situation that would make these people respond to me this way Ooh. that's the first question you gotta ask you Ooh. you gotta ask you and then once you ask yourself that question i would strongly urge you to write it down for real, and then to take that directly into the throne room. I personally believe that every intimacy of my existence is what I can take to the Lord for every kind of answer that I need. I, I really, Ooh. really do. So Ooh. I don't withhold anything about me from God, and I don't take it all the time cute, neither. It's not always, oh, Holy Father, whom I love and trust. It's not always like that. It's like, God, what's up with this? You saw this. You see what I'm doing. Right. And oftentimes he'll say, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I do see. It. And I see you in it. Wow. And you're not all together coming clean, sister. Right. So let me ask you a question. Who are you serving here? You wow. serving yourself with your gifted and talented self? And let me, just, let me just help you with your gifted and talented self. I'm the one gave them to you in the first place. Right. Bottom right. line figure. Gave you the freedom to use them however you want it. But make right. no mistake about it, good sister, don't get it twisted. I'm the one that gifted you and talented you and purposed you. Period. So what you going to do right. with them? So for me, 
And, and, and I got to tell you, man, I had an opportunity of a lifetime and I took the opportunity, Robert, and, and it was great. And when I came back um, in my church, I, I am an ordained elder in the church. Okay. okay. So, when, so I am a part of the leadership. And I say that not for both to brag, but just so the people who are listening can understand. So when I came back from this awesome, awesome opportunity, I was immediately attacked. Wow. The position that they had asked me to serve in was immediately snatched away from me. And I was told some things about me when I said, well, I don't understand what's going on. And they said, well, Renita, it's because you are this, that, and the third. And, and when I tell you, the things that they said cut me to the quick, not wow. because they were true, Robert, because they weren't, wow. but because they thought that of me. Ooh. And I had to go back. And, and while I'm standing there, hot tears rolling down my face, okay, picking up my flesh, wanting to really tell that so-and-so a so-and-so thing. Right. Holy Spirit shut my mouth up tight as a clam and said, tell him thank you and walk out of here. I said, wow. thank you. And I walked away. Hot tears rolling down my face face, Robert. And when I got outside of the building, that's when God began to talk to me. He said, I was the one that purposed you for this anyway. He said, if you can't stand up to this little bitty attack, how are you going to be Ooh. able to stand up to the greater I have ahead of you? He said, who are you serving, wow. girl? Who are you serving? And I realized that my part in all of this was a level of vanity that I would not wow. admit that I had allowed to, 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 to be in me, okay? Wow. There was a level of vanity there. And you know, the Bible says that they that observe lying vanities forsake their own right. mercy, okay? And Ooh, I'm like, well, wait a minute right. now. This is not something I want to right. observe, hang on to, or, or, or move around in without confessing and really taking it to God because I cannot afford to forsake mercy, you know? So, so I immediately right. had to deal with me. And that's the truth about what I did. I also cooled my jets and I pulled myself away from ministry for a time so that I might have ample time to reflect. And at the same time, okay, my heart was tendered to forgive. Okay. Ooh. So, so the first thing you do right. is you got to look at yourself. The second thing that you've got to do is you've got right. to take it into the throne of God with honesty because he know anyway. Right. And then the third right. thing that you have to do is you have to forgive. And then you just keep it moving, okay? That's if you're it. called to stand in a particular place in your Ooh. church, stand there. If you're called to serve in a particular ministry in your church, serve there, okay? Whatever it is, you do it, but you begin to do it to God. Sometimes I think church hurt comes to you so that you can understand that you ain't serving man. You're here for God's purposes. Right. Right. And you can then right. begin really truly to right. serve like you're serving to God. Don't get me wrong, I cried. I cried, I fussed, and I cussed. I'm gonna tell you about it. Okay? But right. I did that in the privacy of my own home in the sanctuary that I have when I need to go to the Lord. Okay? Wow. And I talked to him about every last bit of that. And God is always so merciful and so gracious to those of us that really love him. Right. You know, and I'm not I'm not, you know, making an indictment against anybody else. I'm right. just saying I really love him and I trust him to hold my life and to guide me in the ways that I'm supposed to go. And it always works out to my benefit every single time. Now, when I serve in ministry, I promise you what I'm doing, they can't hurt me with that no more. I don't care what they say about me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I really, truly don't. I don't care what wow. you say because I right. understand that I got God to serve. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. And because I understand that, that's exactly what I do. You know, wow. so the rest of it, you know, I mean, just is what it is. And there are going to be people who are going to help you out of ignorance. There are going to be people who are going to help you because they purpose to help you. You know, I mean, remember, Job was hurt in every other kind of way. And all that brother did was live. Right. Boom. <laughs> Maybe, you know what I'm saying? Right. Maybe right. the hurt is coming at you so that God can show you off because he trusts you to react correctly. He trusts you to react in love. He trusts you to react in understanding. He trusts you to move in forgiveness. He trusts you to continue to help in the places that you've been called to help and to serve. Maybe that's why it's coming. I don't know. Ask God. Maybe he'll tell you. Maybe he won't. But in all of it, 
You need to stand in exactly your level of faith and exactly your level of understanding and, and take it always into the throne room of grace. And that's what will help you and sustain you. So we I appreciate it, Mama. Thank you. <laughs> I love y'all. I, I love, love all of y'all. All of y'all listen to this as a powerful preaching brother whose experiences are real. And if you're smart, you will couple what this young man is telling you with the word of God and you'll be healed. I'm telling y'all, it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen because we're God's children. His promises are true. Then, love you. Well, Mama, we, we thank you. <laughs> I'm going to close there. You know what? I'm going to. I'm going to go into prayer, me and my wife today, and, and if God say the same, yeah. we'll do a part two on this. Okay, Please. we'll definitely do that. Love you, mama. All right, baby. Love you. Talk to you later. Adios. Okay. Well, you heard the wisdom there. That was Miss Shadrach. I called her mama. She uh, helped me through a lot of my storms in Buffalo, New York. Uh, her son was a part of my group, uh, Adam, and she's just been a mama to me. And I tell you, she has a lot of wisdom, her and her husband. They've been married for years and just, it just, it's, and that's another thing. You have to be around people that you can talk to, that you can be transparent. You need to be around people that you can be naked with. You know, you got to have somebody that you can be uh, vulnerable and they don't consider you weak. You have to be people that you can be vulnerable. I can crowd in my wife. I can complain to my wife. I can share to my wife all of my frustrations. And when I'm done, she knows that I'm still going to teach. I'm still going to preach. But we need to vent. We need to have a place to vent. We need to have a place where we can be totally honest. And this is important. A lot of times you can't do that in church. So uh, as I end this, and we'll probably do a part two when the Lord says the same, and it may be tomorrow, uh, I want you to know that you got to know why you at a place. Okay, listen, there are people, and, and I tell you all the time, it's not about the building, it's about the people that's in the building. You got to know who you connect it to. You can tell me about 8,000 things that happen in the church that's wrong. And I can turn around and tell you 8,000 things that happened in the church that were right and blessed people. You can tell me terrible stories about what happened in church and how this messed up this person's mind. And I can give you testimony after testimony of people that say, if it was not for this brother right here in church, and was not for this is the right here in church, where would I be? So the bottom line is you got to know your purpose and your assignment and why you are there. And most of the time, the places that you're supposed to be at, the devil try to drive you out. And the places that you're supposed to not go, the devil tries to drive you in. You got to understand that. And you, have, and the most of all, you have to understand where God is leading you and why you are there. Okay? So you have to understand that. And there's a purpose why you are in situations. I look back over my life and I tell my wife all the time, we, we like best of friends. And I thank God for that. But I tell her, uh, if it wasn't for this, I wouldn't have met you. If it wasn't for this, I wouldn't have did that. I can look at people in my life and look at, you know, I shouldn't have did this. But you know what? The lady that just came on and blessed your life, you know how I met her? I met her in, in, in my second marriage in my life out of Buffalo, New York. But I can look at all the bad things that happened in that marriage, but I got to look at the good things that I met somebody who I can call mama, who I can lean on. So you got to look at all things work together for the good. Do not let the devil show you the negative in anything you're in and not show you the positive of how God is still working some things. And like she said, sometimes God let people put you out so you can see where you're supposed to be. Your alignment is off. Your expectation is off. You, you're putting things in the wrong place. So all these things is necessary. Okay? So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water, but we also don't want the baby to get used to taking the bath in dirty water. So we have to understand that. So, so, and I teach a lesson. If you have a baby sitting in dirty water and been sitting there for a while, and the baby's having fun in the dirty water, do you pull the baby out of the dirty water and the baby screams and high because the baby's been used to the water? Or do you let the baby sit there and you let the water drain out slowly and introduce the baby to another type of fun but not in dirty water? Well, you have to understand the mentality of the baby. Some babies will, will sit there long enough in dirty water to enjoy it that if you pull them out, they're going to panic. Can you handle the panic of people being pulled out of a dirty place because they've been used to playing in it? Or do you have the patience to let the water out and let the dirty water drift away from the baby and replace it with clean water? So you have to be led by God in how we deal with babies in dirty water. Because what's more important, the water being clean or the baby being 
being saved. And you can't take one over the other because the baby needs to be clean, so it needs water. At the same time, the baby don't need to get comfortable with dirt. Okay, so we have to look at all this. So the bottom line is that sometimes we're nothing but we're serving a perfect God with imperfect people. And can you deal with the perfect God with imperfect people to make the imperfect people know how to surrender to a perfect God? This is the key. So my name is Robert Jenkins. My wife is Cassandra Jenkins. Please inbox us if you have questions concerning the church, if you have concerns concerning the church, if you have pains and you want deliverance, you don't want to keep hating your previous pastor, you don't want to keep hating the church. There was a time in my life I would ride past the church and start crying. I had a hate and a distaste for church. This is the same place that I'm designed to help people be delivered. You got to know the attacks, as she said, on your life. So there's so much. But if this is you and you want a greater understanding you want to be restored back to to god not church but god uh but 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 it was in church that you learned about god it was at sunday school that you learned ever since you've uh been offended by church you've also lost your relationship with god you be surprised at the people who say i don't go to church anymore but they don't say they don't pray anymore either you don't pray anymore you don't fast anymore you don't study anymore you don't love god's people anymore a whole lot of things you don't do since you stopped going the church. If you want to talk about it, if you want to inbox us, if you want me to talk about certain subjects, inbox us, give us the comments, let us know, and we'll come back to help you to become whole. If you've been victimized, I'm going to talk about this this week. If you've been molested by a pastor, if you've been hurt by a teacher, if you've been caught out of your money, I'm going to show you how to break strongholds off your life. If you have uh, been used as a musician and abused, please don't miss this week's teaching because you're going to deal with how to recover from it. And, and uh, Dave talked about it. Uh, he talked about spiritual abuse. I did a whole teaching. I'm going to revisit some things that deal with spiritual abuse. And how do you know when you're under uh, abuse church or abuse uh, controlling spirit in your life? Or you are the abuser and you don't know how to stop. See, everybody want to say I've been abused, but nobody want to say I'm the abuser. I've been on both sides, so I understand it, okay? So if that's you, listen, we're trying to bring healthy people to God so you can be whole and not just be healed. We want you to be mature and not just not be in the family, but be understanding sonship and walking your destiny. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow and have a good day. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And remember, Jesus said it like this. Uh, upon this rock, I will build my church. Real church is based upon the revelation of who Jesus is. And if you don't have the revelation of who Jesus is, it don't matter what building you go to. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you tomorrow.